Thanks for inviting me. It's great pleasure to be in Delhi, even so virtually. Uh, so, and please interrupt me at any time with questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, so the motivation for this paper comes from the fact that, uh, well, uh, there is a rise of xenophobia and generally hate uh, in the recent years, or actually all over the world. And uh, we see it in the US, we see it in Europe, and like that's a general phenomenon. At the same time, uh, another global phenomenon that happens at the same time is uh, the rise of social media. So, and what we are trying to do with this paper is to understand whether social media had a causal impact on this increase in xenophobia. So what we do in particular, uh, first of all, uh, we look at the penetration of social media in Russia. And we study how they affected both hate crime and uh, xenophobic ethnic attitudes in 2007 to 2018. To, to understand the mechanisms, we do one step further and we conduct a survey experiment trying to understand the true level of ethnic hate. And finally, we also develop a theoretical model to make sense of all of our findings. So just to give you some preview of the results. First, we find that social media seems to affect hate crime. And one of the mechanisms for this is coordination which is social media can make coordination of different activities, like offline activities, easier. Like it could just reduce. We know from the previous literature that social media can uh, reduce the cost of coordination for protests, but for such uh, a stigmatized activity as hate crime, it could be even more relevant. So, Second, we find that social media indeed can influence people's opinion, which is uh, we, when we use survey experiment and we elicit the true level of ethnic hate, we find that uh, like, uh, social media actually increases this elicited level of hate. And it could be due to two distinct part of the distribution. One is that uh, people who were previously tolerant, they could become intolerant. And another that uh, individuals who already were xenophobic, they could uh, face so-called echo chambers phenomenon, which is if they only see like-minded, uh, meet like-minded people online, then they start to believe that this thing is, uh, like this is the dominant opinion. So, and finally, it could be the case that social media could reduce the stigma of, uh, of hate crimes and xenophobia, which is uh, that uh, people, would start to think that uh, now such an actions or such an attitudes are more approved than before, more likely to be socially approved. And we find no evidence for this channel. If anything, we see some evidence in the opposite direction. Okay. So just to give you uh, some preview, oh, some like uh, literature, 
like overview. How do we think that uh, our paper contributes to the literature? First, we know that there is a literature on the impact of social media on all sorts of things. So there are papers which study the impact of social media on polarization. And there is huge by now literature on social media and protests. And there are even a couple of papers on social media on hate crime in particular by Müller and Schwartz. What our contribution to this literature is that first of all, we look at the long-term impact of social media penetration on hate crime. So we don't look at the impact of particular content. We look at uh, the impact of social media availability. If uh, you now get exposed to social media, what happens to hate crime and what happens to xenophobia? Second, we conduct a separate list experiment in order to study the mechanisms. And finally, we have a theoretical model, which helps to explain everything together. Okay, <laughs> so it also contributes to some wider literature in political economy. There are papers on traditional media and polarization. There are other papers uh, on traditional media used to propagate political ideas and peer-to-peer -peer propagation. And finally, there are papers on like social image concerns deriving different type of outcomes such as charitable giving, campaign contributions, education, and so on. Okay, okay. So uh, what we are going to do, we want to study whether exposure to social media can increase hate crime and whether this effect depends on pre-existing level of nationalism as it is suggested by the literature. So uh, we want to understand the mechanisms and we want to uh, have some theory for this. Okay, so by now I should give you some overview of how we are going to approach identification. As you could guess, uh, social media usage is endogenous to practically everything you could imagine. So people don't flip a coin in order to log into Facebook. So people, like, uh, if you look at the profile of social media users, they tend to be more educated, they tend to be, like, uh, have a particular technical background and so on and so forth, especially in those years. So we cannot just use OLS to study this relationship because OLS, we won't be able to interpret this. So we need a source of variation in the availability of social media. And to create an instrument, we are going to use the history of social media in Russia. And in particular, uh, we are going to use uh, the fact that Russia is one of five countries in the world in which Facebook is not dominant. So they have their own uh, social media and the most popular one during the period that we study was VK. And VK as Facebook was created uh, by Mark Zuckerberg who was a university student, VK was created by Pavel Durov, who was at the time an undergraduate student at St. Petersburg State University. So uh, initially uh, access to VK was by invitation only. 
through student forum at the St. Petersburg State University. And the forum was also created by Durov. So not surprisingly, the first users of VK were mostly students from St. Petersburg State University. Now, St. Petersburg State University is one of the top universities in Russia. In our data, uh, more than two thirds of Russian cities ever send uh, students to St. Petersburg State University. So most of them, they never returned to their home cities. They stayed in St. Petersburg, they moved to Moscow, some moved to Europe, but they kept the networks of friends and families in their home cities. And those people also became early adopters. So Facebook also entered the Russian market, by in, but initially they only offered English language interface, which was quite a deterrence for, for most Russians. So they started to offer Russian language interface in the summer of 2008. But by that time, it was too late. The market was already captured by VK. So, and for example, in 2011, the midpoint of our study, we, there were 55 million of VK users as compared with 6 million of Facebook users in Russia. Okay, so this is Pavel Durov and his uh, web page, his VK web page. <clears throat> so how we are going to construct the instrument? We argue that idiosyncratic variation in who were the early users of VK could have a long-term effect or for network penetration. First, because of network externalities, and second, because uh, like each prevents active Facebook community from being created. Why? If a lot of people in the city already had VK accounts by the time when Facebook enters, then people, potential people who were joining social media, they like, were more likely to join VK because they it has already con community as compared with Facebook, uh, which by that time had only a few accounts. So, uh, and to construct the instrument, we use information on the city of origin of the students in St. Petersburg State University uh, in different years. So we look at people who studied uh, together with VK founder, and compare them with people who we control for the number of people from the same cities, uh, but studying in the same university, but several years before and several years later. And because we can control for older and younger cohort, we can take into account different time invariant factors, which could affect uh, the composition of student flows from different cities to St. Petersburg State University. And this identification was already used in our econometrical paper to study the relationship between social media and protests. Okay, so, before I continue, maybe I should stop and ask if, if everything is clear, if there are any questions about identification. Yeah, Maria, can, I'm, I'm not, so basically, are you going to be using the temporal variation in a city cohort uh, level? So basically in a particular year, a particular city has a particular number of students who are part of this university. And are you basically looking at the changes over time? So when you say that you control for younger and older cohort, that is presumably at the aggregate level, right? 
I mean, that's just a year kind of cohort dummy. And so essentially you're using the city into kind of time kind of variation, right? In identifying no, this no, no, no. Oh. no, we we have a uh, things like uh I'll try to be more clear now. So let me try to go back to this uh slide. Yeah. So we have data in the cost section. I see. So but the, in the cost section, essentially we we know uh how many students we know that if students studied uh, in st petersburg state university they had higher the city had high probability of having vk earlier like and if they had vk earlier then the eventual spread of vk was larger so that's the empirical fact so we uh, like essentially to predict network penetration in the cross section, we look at the number of students from different cities studying in St. Petersburg State University together with Pavel Durov, together with the founder. But to uh, check because like uh, students could come from non-random cities, maybe some cities just they, they're never interested in getting higher education, for example. Mm -hmm. And to control for this time invariant uh, characteristics uh, of cities, which can make some cities more likely to send students to this university, we control for the number of students several years before and several years after. I see. So, so is it clearer? Or I mean, I, I can try to uh, answer, like, uh, uh, like to, to make it more precise, if you want to. No, I, I was just looking at your second point, which basically talks about this cohorts five years prior and yeah. five years later. And so I got the feeling that you're using kind of fluctuations between these cohorts, right? Yeah, so I'm I'm using the fluctuation, yes. But but I'm using them to create a cross-sectional approach. Right. Not a panel one. Okay. Yeah, I get it. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your question. Okay, so what kind of data do we use? So first we use the data on hate crime. Like because this data is not systematically reported by Russian government. So we use the data which is collected by NGO called SOVA. And well, uh, most of the data comes from police reports or like through traditional media. And they contain a very detailed information like uh, the type of the victim, number of perpetrators, uh, the location most importantly. And as a measure of pre-existing nationalism, we are going to use a vote share of nationalistic party called Rodina or Motherland in 2003 parliamentary election. And it was the last parliamentary elections in Russia before the creation of social media. Uh, Maria, I have one question about this definition of hate crime. So is this a, such a heinous kind of crime that it's kind of an absolute and it's not subject to variation of, you know, what is called hate crime by particular areas and stuff like, you know, I mean, some of the interpretation could be different depending on you know who's in power whether the police has been asked to call it that and so on and so forth so is it that uh, is it is this an objective kind of feature and could you give us some examples of what would be considered hate crime uh, in 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 this data set okay so uh, i i have to be more precise thanks uh, so uh, we have only violent hate crime so violent hate crime would be just assault or killing so like that you go on the street uh, and you meet a group of like people and who are going to beat you so that would be an example so and uh, 
like in Russian, in Russian, yeah. Please. I'm sorry. This would be different from just a simple like if the police reports that there has been a you know th there has been a killing, right? And this could be just be a fight between two people. Would that be reported separately from being a hate crime? I mean, uh, you know, when I think about hate crime, I think about you know something which is not in the nature of there's a transaction that is happening and for some reason you know people lose temper and hit the other person and the guy dies or something like that i think of hate crime as a deliberate act you know mm -hmm. coming from some you know from some prejudice or or some you know some idea of you know it's something decided different from this kind of you know so i'm just wondering whether that's coded differently or are we going to treat all kinds of assaults as hate crime no, it's not all kind of assaults. Like in Russian uh, uh, law, there are different, like uh, if the assault is conducted with a motivation of like he, it's a separate part of the law. Like, uh, and it involves like uh, higher potential uh, penalties. So, like, uh, the this kind of classification is mostly done by police. I mean, like, uh, it's true that uh, police in different cities, they might have a different view of watches. But typically, the hate crimes, they are, uh, like, against minorities. They're against immigrants, against minorities. Uh, but the final classification is mostly done by police officers who are in charge of particular case. Whether, uh, so it's not all assault, like by any means. So it's only assaults conducted with a motivation of hate. And that was the mission of this NGO that to collect data on this kind of uh, crimes, on the crimes conducted with the motivation of hate. So, but uh, of course uh, this could be like, uh, I, I made a note, so so like uh, maybe like let me try to see if this misclassification uh, in places with high social media penetration uh, can somehow explain our results. I don't think so, but like uh, no, the the thing is that we also have data from the um, from the survey. And they are independent on this consideration. But for the data on crime, we have to be more careful. Yes. And and the police is sought to be, uh, I mean, I'm just worried about some of the recent, for example, incidents in the US, right? Where in some sense, the, the behavior of the police by itself may be construed to be part of kind of, you know, the hate crime, if you can think of it like that, right? In the sense that, there is a implicit kind of or underlying kind of support for in some areas. Uh, so I'm just wondering whether it's it's just that the police is completely neutral and it's just neutral in the way it kind of reports, or you know, is it tempered by what it thinks would be reported in social media and so on and so forth, and whether that affects and that, that's that's basically what I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. So uh I'm not 100% sure that we can f fully deal with this. Uh, um, so, uh, but uh, like, first of all, like uh, uh, this NGO, they try to complement police reports with traditional media reports. But media can be subject, local media could be subject to the same biases as local police, if they are biased, right? So, uh, and our key uh, focus is on the interaction of social media penetration and pre-existing level of nationalism. So, but uh, this could also make, so, uh, so we have some evidence against misclassification, but we cannot, uh, uh, fully like uh, address this let's put it this way so uh, and one of the evidence is that we see that over time over time we see that the number of heat crime was going down partly because uh, 
uh, in Russia, they like uh, started to be very mm, mm, aggressive uh, to fight this particular type of crimes. So, so I, we think that uh, this police activity was deterring the hate crime. But if anything, uh, social media penetration was going up big time during this time period. So like, this, like uh, this is one of the type of evidence that we have. But, but yeah, it's a, it's a good point. And yes, I made, I made a note about this as well. So, uh, okay, so this is the heat heights. Here you can see uh, the places with heat, like uh, the larger circles show that they had more heat crimes. This is Russia. And uh, in, in the north of Russia, especially in the north and eastern part of Russia, there are no people, that's why there are no dudes. Uh, so, and uh, you can also see places in which we administered our survey. And uh, like uh, red places are places with no survey and blue places are places with survey. Okay, so many hate crimes are indeed conducted in groups. This is from one of these local media reports. Like, uh, these are people convicted for hate crime. Yeah, there was a question? No, okay. Okay, so if we just look at the OLS, what we see is that uh, in places with low support of uh, the Rodina party, with low levels of pre-existing nationalism, we see practically no relationship between uh, VK penetration and hate levels of hate crime. But if we look at places with high levels of pre-existing nationalism, we see a positive relationship between social media and hate crime. And uh, that kind of suggests that social media cannot make people who were previously tolerant to become so intolerant that they run and commit hate crimes. So, uh, but in places in which uh, there were already uh, many intolerant people. It could change something to make hate crimes more likely to happen. Okay. So, Maria, uh, if you... Mar Sorry. Yeah. I think go, go ahead, Abrup, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just wondering if you remove those top three points, do you still, would you not get very similar answers across the both support levels? I mean, it seems that this upward slope is kind of driven by these three points at the top, right? Well, it looks like that. I don't know. It just seems that these are three outliers in in this particular system. Oh, we can remove. Like, I I think that we can remove all three points and still have significant relationship. But that's all less. So we yeah. trust this too much. Anyway, uh, because uh, the social media penetration could be endogenous and everything. It's just for, and that's beans. That's not just the points. That's, uh, that's uh, like we have here 625 cities. Oh, okay. So, so to look at like, uh, more like manageable, so we compress them to beans. So like, but actually, if we just, you just plot all the points, all the cities, then you have a, a kind of uh, the clouds, you know? Okay, okay, yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, hi, Maria, I just wanted to ask, uh, how do you define this low and high? So is it depend, is it sensitive to your definition of low and high support to the Rodena party? Oh, well, uh, here we define it, I, th I think, uh, like, uh, I, I think that it's around 80%. Uh, 
like uh, is uh, like what is above 80 percentile the distribution is very skewed so like uh, things uh, which are below 80 80th percentile they are very comparable in terms of the numbers so things above they have different levels of uh, support of the party so but as i said so we, we shouldn't pay too much attention to this picture this is for mainly for illustration because eventually we are not going to use oilless relationship we are going to use iv for like and there we are going to use just plain uh, level of uh, rodina support rather than right, definition you. of high versus low okay so okay just to give you illustration this is how our first stage looks like and here you can see the how penetration of VK in 2011, which is the midpoint of our study, depended on uh, different student cohorts in different cities. And as you can see from here, uh, in places with higher level of students, uh, with high number of students, from a given city who studied in St. Petersburg State University in the same years as VK founder, we see strong positive relationship. So these cities were more likely to get VK, larger VK communities. While if we look at the coefficients for the number of students from the same cities studying in the same universities several years before or several years after, then we see no significant relationship. So if anything, the coefficient for younger cohort is even negative, but the confidence interval is too large to make any inference about this. Initially, we thought that perhaps younger cohort they would also respond similarly as to the same cohort, because after all, they studied in the same university just several years after. But it turns out that for subsequent VK penetration, what was very important is to get VK first. And these are the people who got VK earlier. Uh, those are the people from the same cohort. Okay, so this is how uh, the first stage looks like. Here, the dependent variable is uh, the number of VK users in 2011. And you can see that it depends differentially on the number of students in the same cohort, younger and older. And also, we provide a kind of placebo test to see whether this student cohort could predict uh, nationalistic party support in 2003, our pre-existing measure of pre-existing nationalism. And you can see that it's not very significant. Okay. Uh, Maria, in the previous table, uh, it's yeah. significant even for the one cohort younger than VK founder. What what is that? Uh, so, um, okay, I, I I have to double check. So I think that it could be misformative table. So which is very bad because it might have been presented it around. And uh, yeah, thanks for the notice. So I think that uh, like uh, one of the cohorts, the younger cohorts, I think just like the, the younger cohorts could be significant, but the magnitude, I, I think just the coefficients are misplaced in terms of the, uh, yeah, I think it's flipped. Uh, it's flipped. Size also says that. Yeah. Yeah. So 
I mean, like, uh, it still could be significant, especially for younger cohort, which is, as I said, that it could be, uh, but like uh, still the coefficient is much larger for the same cohort. And if we like uh, study the p-value for equality with old and young cohort, so like uh, we see that they're significantly different from each other. So, and that's essentially what we need for identification. And Maria, is this class? I, I see that there are no clustering here. So, oh, no, there should be clustering. Yeah. I see. Okay. All right. Yeah. And at what level is the clustering? Do you, the uh, region. Region. Ah, the region. Okay. Uh, Russia has 89 regions. At least had at the time. <laughs> so, and they had some administrative change since then. But, yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is the baseline uh, IV relationship between uh, VK penetration and the number of victims of hate crime for different categories of the hate crime. And um, what here we also use because our instrument becomes kind of weak when we use for the interaction term. Then we use weak instrument robust confidence sets. So which is uh, the recent econometric technique which allows you to get confidence sets even if your uh, instrument is not very strong. So, uh, and what you can see is that if we look at just plain relationship between social media penetration and hate crime, we see no significant relationship for any type of the hate crime. And so as a result, uh, we don't have this relationship on average. On the other hand, pre-existing literature suggests that uh, pre-existing uh, level of support of uh, uh, xenophobic attitudes and hate crime and nationalism in general could and should play a role in like, uh, whether city has at all some hate crimes or not. And this is exactly what we find. If we look at the interaction term between the VK penetration and pre-existing level <laughs> of nationalism. So we, we start seeing a very significant positive relationship for most categories of ethnic and also non-ethnic hate crime. So, and our 95% weak instrument robust confidence sets are, are above zero in most total for like a total number of victims and we have similar table for the total number of crimes. So uh, what you can also take away from this table is that uh, there is also a difference between uh, hate crimes conducted by single perpetrator and hate crimes conducted by multiple perpetrators. The coefficients are always larger for the multiple perpetrators. And if we compare these coefficients in the reduced form version of this estimation, then they are significantly different from each other. So uh, what it kind of suggests is that uh, coordination could play a role in the impact of social media on hate crimes. Otherwise, we would see the same coefficient for single perpetrator and for multiple perpetrator. And also you can see here that if we look at the effect that for the minimum level of support of national nationalistic party, which is for the minimum level of pre-existing nationalism, 
you see no significant relationship. But if we look at the maximum uh, level of support of nationalistic party or maximum level of pre-existing nationalism, then we see this is the last two lines of the table. Then you can see that uh, uh, this effect becomes positive and significant in most specification. Okay. So uh, how to interpret the numbers, the magnitudes? So, well, the effect of 10% increase in social media penetration has different effect depending on the level of pre-existent nationalism. In places with the minimum level of pre-existent nationalism, we see no change in either the number of crimes or the number of victims. In places with the highest level of pre-existing nationalism, we see approximately 25% more crimes and 25% more victims. And we see the biggest increase in crimes which are conducted by multiple perpetrators. So, like, uh, we have some data on hate crimes before the creation of social media. And because of that, we, we are using them to construct a placebo estimate. So we have a caveat that uh, this data, like the on NGO themselves, they claim that this data could be, the data before 2007 could be of slightly lower quality than like the data afterwards, because it's incomplete. Nevertheless, if we just repeat the same exercise for 2004 to 2006, the years before the creation of social of VK, then we see that this coefficient for the interaction is not significant in either specification, and it's mostly negative. The point estimate is negative, I think, in, yeah, in all the specification. But weak instrument robust confidence sets, they always include zero. So this is consistent with the idea that like what we are uncovering is the true effect of social media rather than some sort of um, pre-existing uh, uh, characteristic of the city, which happened to correlate with uh, like this uh, fluctuations uh, in student cohorts. And we had similar, like similarly in the other paper, we showed that this, uh, like uh, when we instrument social media penetration with the student cohorts, it does not have any relationship with pre-existing political preferences of the population before 2006 and pre-existing political protests before 2006. So this uh, result is consistent uh, with those results. Okay. So what we found so far, first the average effect of social media on hate crime is very small and not statistically significant. So which suggests like uh, that indeed social media cannot take average tolerant person and make uh, this person so intolerable that they go and commit hate crimes. But here the existing level of nationalism could play a role which is that we find that social media, availability of social media led to higher levels of hate crimes only in places with high pre-existing nationalism. And this effect is stronger for crimes conducted by multiple perpetrators. So what kind of mechanisms could we see? So, the, some evidence is consistent with coordination mechanism. 
but we also see increase in heat crime, even for those heat crimes which are conducted by single perpetrators. So, like, and for that, we could have two different explanations. One would be persuasion, and another would be social stigma. And to differentiate between the mechanisms, we conducted our own survey experiment. In particular, what we do, in 125 cities, uh, we did uh, a survey which uh, asked uh, people about uh, like uh, what do they, how do they feel about other nationalities? And the question that we ask is a question, it was not invented by us, is a question which is typically used by Russian sociologists to study this. And this is a question, do you feel annoyance or dislike toward some ethnicities without specifying which ethnicities? Russia is a very large country, so in Russia, there are more than 1,000 ethnic groups. So it's, uh, it's not useful to like uh, list particular ethnicities here because like different Russians might have different feelings toward different ethnic groups. So, uh, and we ask this question directly. Maria, just one question. But yeah. given the large number of ethnic groups uh, are the ethnic groups to some extent spatially segregated in terms like I'm just thinking that if I'm in a particular city, I may not like a particular group, but that group lives so far away that, you know, I have some preferences over it because I've heard something from people, but it's not necessarily that this will lead me to have an altercation and a particular kind of incident, right? So this would be relevant for the ethnic group, which is more likely to be in my neighborhood. I mean, any strong preference or dislike for should affect that, right? Because given yeah. that Russia is a large country, there's a high chance that you may not like some group, but that group is so far away that it shouldn't really matter. So I'm wondering whether this, this open-ended part of it also makes it a little bit, uh, you know, hard to pin down whether it's exactly the people you're cohabitating with in the city that you don't like. No, that's definitely true. I mean, like, ideally, we wanted to figure out like, if you are living, for example, with uh, together with uh, people from particular ethnic group, whether you also feel bad about people from particular ethnic group. But uh, first of all, as I said, this is not a question that we invented. This is like uh i mean uh economists are not great in like uh using the uh, can, uh, writing the text of the questions so we just trust sociologists on this and second uh even uh, like in many places people just don't know like what particular ethnic group they don't like i mean like they see some people who look differently from them they don't know whether they came from, for example, from particular Republic of North Caucasus. So, and even one Republic in North Caucasus, Dagestan, it had more than 100 ethnic, different ethnic groups. I'm sure that like, ordinary Russian, me included, I, I just don't know all these 100 ethnic groups and it's impossible to differentiate between them even like in terms of the broader region. So I think that this is the reason why this kind of question is asked. I mean, like if we would be in the United States, if you want to study the attitude toward African-Americans, that's very clear. Like, that's very particular type of group and it's everywhere. And here it's a little bit different. Thank you. Okay, so what we do, how do we study this? So as I said, control groups, uh, they are, we ask them this question directly. 
But we think that some people, maybe they feel this annoyance or dislike towards some ethnicities, but uh, they are not willing to like answer, put a different answer in like direct question because they think that, oh, like uh, this is not a good thing to say. So uh, we use list experiment. And what is the list experiment? We ask not about whether you agree with this particular statement. We give them separ several statements and we ask them with how many statements do you agree with? For example, one of the statements could be that uh, I'm worrying about uh, increase in prices. I think that pensions should be increased and so on and so forth. So now control group only gets non-sensitive statements. Treatment group gets all the same list of statements as control groups plus one sensitive statement which is that you feel annoyance or dislike towards some ethnicities. And when you compare the average number of people who agreed with this average number of statements that people agree with in the control group with the average number of statements people agree with in a treatment group, then you see that the difference would be a measure, the share of people among treatment group who agreed with the statement. So, and this is, uh, this uh, technique was uh, originally invented precisely to measure racism, to measure uh, like attitudes towards people, different race. What if like you are racist, but you don't want to say it openly. So, so this is uh, what this technique uh, was invented for. Okay. So uh, at the individual level, because we are interested in the interact in the impact of wiki, at the individual level, we look at the. Um, interaction of having an extra option in the field, ex, uh, in the least experiment with uh, VK penetration as predicted by student cohorts. While at the city level, we just compress everything together. Okay, so if we look at the city level, then you can see that uh, for the full sample on average here, we start seeing the positive relationship between social media penetration and xenophobia. So significant at 10% level. But then if you, we start looking into uh, subcategories, then you see that for particular groups, in particular those with low education, and those who are younger on average, we see particularly strong effect of social media penetration on the level of uh, elicited ethnic hostility. So, and note that those are precisely the groups uh, of people who are more likely to commit the hate crime. So we find it kind of consistent with that. So this is just to for the sake of illustration. Again, like we cannot uh, do these pictures for IV, but we do it for OLS. And you can see that again, it's bent, like uh, because we have too many cities to show like 625 points. So like uh, each point is a bin. So and we see that high levels of VK penetration led to high level of uh, inferred ethnic heat at the city level. 
Oh, uh, no, here it's uh, it's not 625 cities. Here is 125 cities because that's the number of cities uh, for which we um, uh, conducted uh, the um, our survey analysis. Okay, so we can also try to see whether there is any heterogeneity at the city level. So to interact it with pre-existing level of uh, nationalism. And we find that if anything, like we don't find much significance for like the subcategory except the young ones. But we find that if anything, the interaction term is negative rather than positive. So that's sort of puzzling, and that's why we are going to need a theoretical model. Okay. So, and finally, we also have an estimate of the social stigma. And for social stigma, to estimate the stigma, we subtract uh, it, the answers to direct question from the answers to, to, from the estimate of the city level hate using an indirect question. So, and like, uh, if people are more likely to feel stigma or less likely to feel stigma in answering these questions as a result of exposure to social media, that means that uh, they should be like, uh, the coefficient for uh, VK penetration should be uh, uh, positive for increase in stigma and negative for decrease in stigma. So, and for stigma to explain the effect on the hate crimes, the effect should be negative. But here we find positive and significant effect, which is that people are less likely to admit that they hate other ethnicities uh, in open question in places with high social media penetration. They are not more likely to admit, they are less likely to admit. So as a result, we don't find any evidence that social stigma can indeed explain uh, the, our relationship. Uh, Maria, in terms of the gender usage of this VK network, is it uh, equally, is the gender ratio more or less equal? I mean, uh, equal number of men and women actually use it? I'm just wondering whether it's more popular among one gender versus the other. No, I think that in the beginning, in the very early stage, it was more popular among men. But I think close to the end of our observation period, it was slightly more popular among women. So in the end, it was on average, there was no difference. So, but of course, there could be difference for like level of education and for young versus old, so. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and if we do heterogeneity of stigma analysis at the city level, then again, we see that like if anything, uh, the interaction term is negative, uh, the direct term is positive. So that's something that uh, we would like to explain with the model. So overall, what we find is first, there is a strong uh, positive effect of social media, uh, both at the individual and at the city level. And uh, if we look at the heterogeneity with, for pre-existing nationalism, then if anything, we see negative effect at the city level, we have too much weak instrument problem for individual level regression, so we cannot say anything, but coefficients are consistently negative. 
So this positive direct effect is consistent with a story of persuasion that uh, in places with high social media penetration, we observe high levels of xenophobia. And at the same time, we don't see evidence for the stigma story. So uh, this is the individual level results. Uh, this is uh, again self-reported hostility uh, for like where the levels of observation are um, the um, individuals. And you can see that we can't really estimate the interaction term because weak instrument confi uh, robust confidence sets include the entire group. So, so we just can't say anything about this. So now in the last minutes of my presentation, I'll give you a glimpse of the model that we uh, construct in order to explain our results. So we need a model that predicts uh, high levels of hate crime in places with high social media. Yeah? Please? Sorry, so, uh, yeah. Maria, I have a quick clarification before we move on with the model. So is it that this trend that you're observing of increased hate crime, is it true in general like for crime per se? Because it's possible that higher you know, uh, usage of it might just increase crime in general, not specific to hate crime, right? Yes, that's an excellent question. We spend quite a bit of time trying to answer this. But the problem is that the crime reporting in Russia is only done at the regional level. Like we, we try to find some connections even to get this data at the city level and we could do it. So like, it's impossible. Like we know some people who got these numbers for some of the cities but for too, too small sample to like, cover something close to what we have here. So unfortunately, that would be the first thing that we would check if the data was available. That's why we also relate on this NGO data at the city level because, well, uh, in principle, if uh, the crime data would be from police would be available at the city level, then we could use directly the police data, but we cannot. Okay, thank you. Okay. So to explain things, we need a model that social media leads to higher levels of hate crime, but only in places with a higher pre-existing nationalism. And if anything, we see uh, like also we need to, uh, the model to predict higher level of uh, uh, hostility toward other ethnicities in places with higher levels of social media penetration. But the interaction term, it could have different uh, signs, we observe we should observe stronger effect of social media in places with high levels of pre-existing social nationalism and the weaker effect of social media in places with uh, on hostile attitudes in places with high level of pre-existing socialism nationalism. So uh, and the model that we use, it's actually, it's a quite simple belief updating model. We assume that there is a continuum of people with some political positions, and there is a distribution of political position at the initial moment in time with expectation mu. And, uh, like if we know the political, the distribution of political positions of people at the moment T minus one, the new position uh, depends on the previous position as following. 
it depends on their own view with weight w and it depends on uh position of other individuals we weight one minus w and from this other individuals share of tau is exactly like i it's very similar and one minus tau would be just random other individuals so here you can see that the process is uh, of belief formation like here for example x uh, could be a level of xenophobia so it uh, it is equal to x i t minus one with the weight w plus one minus w multiplied by tau and with some remaining weights it depends on just average opinion of people in the society and what we say here is that well tau could proxy for social media penetration because we know from the literature on social media that uh, in social media people's interactions are characterized by homophily which is they are more likely to uh, interact with like-minded people so that they could end up in echo chambers. So for any initial distribution uh, of beliefs, we can define a limit distribution. We find that uh, in the limit, the society converge to the distribution of beliefs with the same uh, average. So that's essentially what we see is that uh, we see that there is no average shift in people's opinions. But at the same time, uh, the variance of this distribution, it depends on omega tau and uh, the variance of, of the idiosyncratic shock. So, and with higher social media, with higher tau, we see that the distribution starts to have fatter tails. In other words, uh, social media can increase polarization in this model. And now, if we go back to uh, like our particular sub, our particular setting, here X would be tolerance xenophobia. So we are studying what we were focused on, think on empirically, uh, the number of people who are to the right of particular thresholds. And one threshold would be like a relatively extreme threshold would be committing hate crime. If I'm so xenophobic that I'm at the very extreme level of the distribution, then I'm ready to commit hate crime. If in contrast, we want to study xenophobia, xenophobic attitudes, then this threshold would be not so extreme because there are many more people who dislike other ethnicities as compared with the people who commit actually commit hate crime. So what would be the effect of increased polarization uh, on these numbers? It is going to be the strongest for places with the highest uh, penetration of network. So, so here you can see it. So what we say is that uh, the effect uh, is the strongest if the threshold is clo close to the inflection point of the normal distribution. But we know that the, um, uh, the threshold for heat crime uh, uh, is likely to be very extreme. So for example, 
you can think that initially the threshold for the heat time was Q3, and now like uh, OQ2. And now like uh, with social media, the distribution of beliefs starts having fatter tails. And you can see immediately that in places with a high level of pre-existent nationalism, we see a high level of uh, increase in social in the number of uh, people who commit hate crime because that's given by the shaded green area to the right of the Q2. So, uh, and, but he just expressing some dislike to other ethnicities is more ordinary. It's actually close to the midpoint of the distribution. So it's likely to be between mu and mu plus sigma. So it's likely to be in the red shaded area. So because of that, we can see here a negative interaction rather than positive interaction for the heat crimes. So, so this is what I just told you. So that heat crimes are luckily a very rare event. It's definitely less than 16% of people. It's less than 1% of people who ever commit hate crime in their life, even if they have some opportunity. So the threshold for hate crime is at the top of the distribution. Thus, social media effect is stronger for higher levels of pre-existing nationalism. In contrast, dislike of other ethnicities is very common. Like in our sample, 38% uh, expressed dislike to other ethnicities uh, with elicited technique and 33% answer so in direct questions. So, and because, of, because it's between mu and mu plus uh, sigma, it, follows that because of this polarizing effect of social media, the social media effect close to the center becomes weaker. Okay, so I think that I should wrap up. So uh, what we did in this uh, project, we find some, uh, we show that social media uh, penetration led to increase in hate crime but only in places with high level of pre-existent nationalism. We also see increase in xenophobic attitudes in places with high level of hate crime. And uh, the xenophobic attitudes are more likely affected in groups more likely to engage in hate crime, which is young and low educated. Finally, there is no evidence that social media actually reduced. If anything, it seems to increase stigma of expressing xenophobic attitudes. And finally, our results are consistent with the theoretical model, uh, which is based on social media increasing polarization type of story without making overall society more hateful. Okay, so I stop here and I am happy to answer any remaining questions. Uh, any questions, anyone? Well, I think I, people have asked Many questions, anyways, yep, on the way. Yeah, sure. So, uh, 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 so last call. Anyone else? Otherwise, uh, uh, I request you to leave. Uh, you know this session, and Maria, you can stay back, and uh, we can probably talk a little bit. But mm -hmm. others can um, can then leave. So let me give everyone a little bit of time to exit.